My mother never talked about the war growing up, and I didn't understand why. And I always had questions, but that's what she did. Then one day I ended up taking a shoebox out of a drawer, and it was filled with black and white photographs of her youth, of her parents, and one, we went through them one by one, and she started to open up about the war and about her family. And I had no idea there was so much military background in our family. Um, my mother was born in 1911, Isabel Edith Gillespie, and her parents were Robert Alexander Gillespie and Anne Winifred Marion Monroe. They ended up having six children. They had, my mom was the first, then there was Aunt Kay, and Uncle Don, and Uncle Jack, and Aunt Marion, and then there was a young uh, baby that died in infancy, Robert Neal. Um, when she started to talk about the war, um, she had many things that she did, and it was, I don't want to say dragging her out of her, but just getting her to open up about some things. She talked with a lot of pride about her family. For example, her dad, who was known as Bert, he was the first and only commanding officer of the 226 Men of the North unit in World War I. Her uncle, um, my great uncle John, was killed in World War I. Even her brothers, Uncle Don and Uncle Jack, served in World War II. She was decorated by King George VI for her role in setting up the largest field hospital. Um, she and her unit had to move the tents and the hospital to stay close to the battlefields. They had to follow the Allied troops as they fought in brutal battles from northern France to Belgium and, and pushed the Germans back. I remember her telling me that she was a good unit and she only received the decoration because she was second in command and she kept giving the credit to all of her unit. It was the first 1,200 bed to ever to be brought into a battle. When they defeated the Germans, um, her unit, she had to stay longer and they began to get prisoners of war in the hospital. And they were located in a farmer's field and water kept coming up under the tents and under the beds and they had stopped being active, but they were having to take care of the prisoners of war, and it was so large that it was hard to move her hospital. It was interesting talking to Mother about why she signed up for the war, because she was a volunteer. She had signed up because at the time she was working in the neurological institution in Montreal, and they decided that there should be a neurological unit looking at the soldiers coming back from, from the war, coming back from battle. So they asked some people to join the unit, and it was a great setup, according to Mother, because the Governor General of Canada at the time had been a patient at the Nero. So they felt it would be a good thing to go to war for a year, and then they'd switch and they'd replace each other, so they would only serve a year. But what they didn't realize that when the Army takes over, they couldn't do that. So my mother ended up serving five years during World War II. Mother talked quite a bit about Basingstoke, and at first the patients were housed in, the, in Basingstoke, but as more patients came in from battle, they built wards in the back for the patients, and the mansion um, was for the headquarters for staff and the others. The wards for patients were called huts, but they called them the nut house, something politically incorrect in these days. But that's where they put soldiers who were having mental challenges from the trauma of the battle scenes at World War II. She told me one story that the hospital needed to check if somebody was faking his illness. Sometimes the men would come back and be, have battle fatigue, serious battle fatigue. And, but they weren't quite sure who was faking it to avoid the battle or who was seriously needed treatment. So as, a, as an idea, they asked my mother to go on a date with a patient for the idea that he would try to impress this young nurse and want to have a future with this young nurse. Well, what was interesting is my mother's reaction was a frustration and anger because what they did before they asked her was they went to a young man she had gone on a date with twice and they asked his permission if she would, he would allow her to go on a date with his patient for medical reasons. Well, she was furious because she said, what, he doesn't own me, I've merely gone on one, a few dates with him. She went ahead and decided to go on the date with the patient. Oh, and she came back and she told the doctors, he's had problems, he needs to stay here. You know, I've got to read you a, a cute letter that I found in all the paperwork of mothers, among all the black and white photographs and the scramble in the shoebox. 
It was a poem written by one of the doctors, and it was called Old Mother Goldie, and it was about my mother. Old Mother Goldie went to the cupboard to get the dressings for Dr. Cohn, but when she got there, the cupboard was bare. So she called Miss Gillespie by phone. She said, I've forgotten our last little store, and I'm really ashamed to ask Stanley for more. I know we have plenty, I hid them away, but the place I forgot, so now what can I say? Miss Gillespie replied, I'll come over right soon. I'll be glad to get some of them out of my room. And that was written by Stanley Ellis, and he was one of the doctors there. Apparently, Mother had a trick that she used to do where she would, when supplies would come in, um, she would always hold out just a few for those last minute requests so that she always had something in her room that she would hide. It's funny, I reflect on that because in raising my children, I always had what I called the secret closet because when pens or crayons or something would get hidden or we'd need a last minute gift for a birthday closet, for a birthday present, I'd go to the secret closet and I always had something. And now I realize I'm just taking after my mother. Mother would comment about how horrid uh, the war was, but occasionally they would take a break and Mother was asked to play tennis for the British and the American doctors so they could watch a fun tennis game. Um, and there's some pictures I know that were in that shoebox of her playing tennis in World War II. There was a funny story that she told me about meeting my father in the war. Now first you have to understand, they were both from Winnipeg, Manitoba, both born on the same day, though my father was five years younger, both raised in Winnipeg, went to school in Winnipeg, uh, attended university, but they didn't meet until they were stationed in England during World War II. Dad had asked her out for a date, and she wanted to impress him. He was a nice young man, a doctor. This could be a fun date. But Dad had never been to the officer's club, so she suggested dinner there. About a week or two after a successful date, she goes to the club and was horrified to see John, Pointer, or Wyatt at the officer's club with a different woman. Well, obviously they worked it out because they did get married before the war ended. I even found his three-day leave pass and the receipt from the marriage in the shoebox. They were married in their army uniforms in Paris in 1945.